welcome. And thank you for taking a moment this morning to focus in on the things of God. This morning we're going to look at three passages in the book of Philippians. We're going to read a verse in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. We're going to read two verses in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 12 and 13. And then in Philippians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 20 and 21. There are some essentials that Paul gave to the first century church. When we think about Paul, we remember him as one of the greatest preachers and missionaries, martyrs, etc., that the Christian world has ever known. When you think about the things that we would call the essentials, the doctrines of our faith, I would guarantee that over 75% of the passages you're going to use to talk about those things were written by Paul. Because God used Paul's ministry in a way that will never stop having an impact on the Christian faith. It doesn't matter how long the world lasts. Paul's writings will be having an impact on the Christian faith in one way or another. Paul wrote to bring glory to God, but he also wanted to show us how we should be responding to the world around us as believers. And the things he wrote about were essential for the spiritual growth and effective witnessing of the church, not just in his day, but also in our day. And in the passages we're going to read today, Paul was encouraging the disciples in Philippi to cooperate with God. And he knew God was working through them, but he wanted those people to see the responsibility they had to that work that God was doing in them. So we'll look at that passage in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. And we'll understand that God's work starts in our conversion. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, the Bible says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The church in Philippi had heard about the love that Jesus had shown through his life and his death and resurrection. And Paul taught them what they needed to know uh, to get that new life in Christ. And our conversion is the first step in the response to God. It's the way that God starts his work on our behalf. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul was talking to the people at the church in Rome. And he said, do you show contempt? For the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. When we really take what Jesus did for us on the cross seriously, it should lead us to a point that we want to be saved when we understand it. Our works don't save us as, uh, as we have to make the effort to take the first step in our faith. And the Bible says that God is the one who leads us into salvation. So it starts with that conversion. And after we've done that, God's work continues as we cooperate. In Philippians chapter 2, in verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Again, our works don't get us into heaven. The Bible is very clear about that, even if we've done the, the things we do in a very sincere and devout way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say, it says that we're saved by faith through grace and not by works. No one can boast about it. But what I think Paul is saying in this passage is because of our salvation, the response we would naturally have is to cooperate with God. So let's understand a few things that will happen if you really want to cooperate with God as he leads you. First of all, you have to use his book. The Bible is the operation manual of, of Christianity. I mean, think of where we would be without the Bible. If you didn't have the Bible, what would guide your understanding of God or who Jesus was or the commands of God and all sorts of things? I read some time ago uh, that there was actually a movement in some Christian churches to discourage their members from bringing Bibles to church with them because they didn't want to scare away people who weren't Christians. <laughs> Listen, if we deny the scripture, we're on shaky ground because God communicates through his word. You don't have to have a degree to get something out of it. You just have to spend time in it. We need, we need that word. But we also need to pray. 
Prayer is the way we communicate with God, but more importantly, it's a way that God communicates with us. A lot of times people make the mistake of thinking that just because they can't hear an audible voice that God's not speaking to them. You need to really listen to the voice in your heart. Most of the time, the people who are looking for signs from God, they already know what it is that God wants them to do. They're just afraid to do what God wants them to do. God's always speaking. As you read through the Bible, there's not one person that God spoke to who didn't understand what God wanted them to do and knew it was coming directly from God. We just need to listen, and then we need to do what God's telling us to do. But then we also let the church be the church in our lives. Too often we make the mistake of going, of thinking that on Sunday we, we go to Sunday school and then we go to church. I want you to understand something. Everything is church. <laughs> the Sunday school, the worship, the training, and really those things aren't actually the church. Maybe you remember as a child, maybe you learned this. This is the church. This is the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. Well, we got it backwards because this is the church. God uses the church as a way of expressing his presence and love to us. I can't tell you how many times over the years how people who are in grief, they've just lost a loved one, they're amazed at the support they get from the church. And I always remind them that that's just one way that God reminds them that he's always there for them. But then we also pay attention to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't just drop in from time to time when we need him. The Holy Spirit should be living in us constantly. And we have to be aware of what he's trying to say, that inner voice that we need to be willing to understand and obey. Again, God's always speaking to us. We just have to learn to listen. So we begin with that conversion, and then we move on to cooperate with God. But all of that will be brought to completion and consummation when Christ returns. In Philippians chapter 3, in verses 20 and 21, the Bible tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will become like his glorious body. As our salvation begins with conversion, continues through the consecration or cooperation of our lives, it's consummated, it's completed when Christ returns. Think about this. When we were converted, we were saved from the penalty of sin. As we cooperate and grow in Christ, we're saved from the power, the practice of sin. And when Christ returns, we're going to be delivered from the presence of sin. I don't know that I can even fathom that, a world where there is no sin. So in this world, we understand that our citizenship is actually in heaven. And while we're here, we're living to honor God until that day that we actually go home to be with him. That's a day as, as believers we should be looking forward to. But if you're not a believer, that won't make any sense to you. But there is a hope beyond this world. There is a heavenly home, and we're looking forward to it. If you've never received Christ, I'm about to have a prayer with you, and I pray that you would pray with me and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and lead you to that point of salvation. So join me as we pray. Lord, again, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for the blessing of another day. And Lord, as we think about who we are, the process we're in, the cooperation we're, we're going through right now as a church with you. I pray that we would look forward to that day that it's consummated, that it's completed through the return of Christ. And Lord, I pray for those today who've never received you as Lord and Savior, that you would work in their hearts, that you would speak to them in a powerful way and lead them to that saving knowledge. We commit it all to you and trust in all things your will be done. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.